Okay. Here we go. I want to, first of all, thank every one of you for coming out to church tonight. And uh, not just coming, just, uh, you could have been anywhere, chosen to be anywhere, but you've chosen to be here. And I really do appreciate that, especially those of you that uh, it, was, uh, it was challenging for you to be here. We thank you. Every service uh, that you attend is an addition to uh, what God is seeking to do in your life. But I also want to thank you for extending your love towards uh, my wife and I in friendship. We've come to know many of you now. And uh, memories of you remain uh, intact, and we hope that that would be the case with you and us. You remember us. And then finally, I want to thank you for your uh, generous, uh, thoughtful offering that you've extended towards us. Uh, it goes a long way, and uh, may the Lord bless you. And, uh, and reward you bountifully for considering to be a blessing to us. Second Samuel chapter 11, what do you preach on the final night of uh, a series of meetings that started with a marriage seminar? And so, but what do you preach? I know what to preach. I have to preach the word of God. Nothing else, nothing particular. I'm not here to uh, demonstrate I just want to preach the word of God I want at the end of my life I want Jesus to say to me well done thou good and faithful servant enter into the joy of your Lord and so whilst I was uh, uh, alone in the hotel this afternoon I pondered on what to preach and uh, if you're here and my trust is that you've come with some of the tools of your trade. And uh, remember what I said, zero attracts zero. Uh, but one can put a thousand to flight. So um, if you don't know all what that means as the end of the service comes, uh, run around and find something of your tool of your trade and get it and bring it here. Second Samuel is what I want to read from. Most people pull back from events of life. And sometimes they don't even realize that they are pulling back. And this evening we are going to examine the life of a man. We're going to look into the word of God and see whether we are guilty of pulling back. Maybe God will expose to you areas of your life that you have pulled back. In and help you as he helped me when I was writing this sermon. I, most of my sermons I preach to myself first because I identify with all that is in the word of God. Second Samuel, let's read together. Chapter 11, we're going to read from verse 10. Now, many of you are familiar with this scripture and you know the backdrop of the story, but I want to home in on verse 10. And I'm going to read down to verse 17, if you follow with me. The Bible says, so when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house. David said that, uh, to Uriah, did you uh, not come from a long journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Um, and Uriah said to David, that the ark of Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in an open field. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As you leave and as your soul leaves, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, wait here today and also and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem and that day and the next, now when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and then he made him drunk, and at the evening uh, he went out and lie on his bed um, with the servant of his Lord, uh, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, um, it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah, 
And he wrote in the letter saying, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So it was when Joab besieged the city that they, he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there would be violent men. Um, and then, uh, where, and then uh, the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite uh, died um, also. I want to minister a sermon I've entitled, Don't Let the Good Man Die, or Don't Let the Good Woman Die. And I want to consider with you three key areas that my hope is would help you. The first is the tried and the trusted man. Most people, they, uh, you know, they despise being tested. I don't know what you were like when you were in school. I certainly didn't like facing examinations. I didn't like facing tests. Uh, but we desire promotion. We want to go to the next level, but we don't want to be tested. Uh, we desire recognition. But let me say this to you tonight. Finding credibility is oftentimes established uh, when we are faced with various tests in life. For you to move to whatever level you consider is the next level, you need to be tested where you are, and you will have to excel where you are before you are moved to the next level. I remember uh, a few months ago, we had a collapsed building in Nigeria. This was a story building. It was 22-story high, and um, uh, it came tumbling down in a highbrow area of Lagos. Upon the time that the investigators began to investigate this building, they discovered that uh, that they had actually never passed the test. There are conditions that you must meet if you're going to build a high tower. But these builders, somehow they bypassed these tests. Uh, they got approval through the back door. And it's not surprising that uh, when pressure came upon that building, it collapsed not only did it collapse, uh, it killed over 50 workers in there, including the owner. The reason why we test things in life is to establish credibility and usability. This pulpit will have been tested to know whether it's able to withstand the pressure of Pastor Glenn banging on it. These microphones will have gone through similar testings to see whether they are usable. <clears throat> David, as a young boy, we know his story. He was faced with various tests in the field of his father. <clears throat> the Bible says that when um, his father's flock was being attacked, uh, he faced the bear. He faced the lion, excuse me. And he excelled fighting and defending that which belongs to his father. <clears throat> he passed the test. Before ever facing Goliath, he didn't just wake up one day and say, I am a giant basher. I can defend and I can defeat the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the giants. But he had actually been tested in obscurity <clears throat> before he can be trusted in the open. There are people sitting there, you desire great things. You want to have resources. <clears throat> you want to be wealthy. Perhaps you want to be hailed. There are things that you're dreaming of. But can I say this to you? For you to get to that place, you will be tested. Tithing is a test. <clears throat> people think that tithing is just a way of the church. Yes, thank God that when you excel in that test, the church can advance. But it is a test. And many fail that test, but yet they want to be promoted in the things of God. We know of a man by the name of Joseph. <clears throat> Joseph was tested all the way in obscurity. He was a son that was favored by his father. Before Joseph ever became the prince in Egypt, he had faced many, many tests. Let me list some of the tests that Joseph faced. And before you start saying, I want Joseph's blessings... And I want Joseph's impact. 
Maybe you should think about, I want Joseph's testings also. The first test that Joseph had to face was what is known as a pride test. He had a coat of many colors, and you know, if you are the favorite son in your home, uh, and your father, you know, is buying you a, a PS2, or what do they call it? You know what I mean. You're bragging and boasting to all your siblings that, hey, I'm a favorite child. Uh, pride was filled in his heart. And then we know it was a result of that pride that his brothers despised him. Uh, amen. Uh, they found him in the field, uh, uh, bringing goods to them. Uh, but then the, the, uh, the, the Bible says that they, they, they saw him as an insolent boy. Uh, they picked him up uh, uh, and they dumped him in a pit. Now, by the time I finish these tests that Joseph went through, many of you would hear the word P, 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 P all the way. So the first test that he faced was called the pride test. The second test is called the pit test. <clears throat> Sometime in life, you may be dumped in the pits of life. How you react in the pit matters. <clears throat> Joseph was thrown in the pit. Then the next thing that we read about Joseph was that he was sold as, sla as a slave on the podium. At that time, all his pride had gone. He's now being beaten for as a slave. He's on the podium test. <clears throat> and then later on, we know that he found himself in Pontifar's house. Whilst in Pontifar's house, he was entrusted with everything. That's where many of us feel. As soon as your boss entrusts you <clears throat> with things, and then we start pilfering things. We start helping ourselves, but not so with Joseph. He was faithful even as a stranger in Potiphar's house. Then the next test that he faced is what is known as a purity test. Joseph is there. <clears throat> a woman, uh, uh, the wife of Potiphar is, is making passes at him. Uh, many of us will take advantage. Uh, if the governor's wife likes me, uh, then I must have some good things about me. But he passed the purity test. From the purity test, the Bible tells us that he was thrown in prison. Whilst in prison, this is where the real test begins. When you are being judged unjustly and you are being abandoned and forgotten. He's in prison. He passed that test. He's not bitter. He comes out of the prison. Uh, and, uh, you know, they call him. He's standing uh, in the palace now. He's facing the palace test. And then from the palace test, he faces Pharaoh's test. Pharaoh is asking him, is it true that you can uh, 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 tell me what this dream is all about? Uh, and we know he also excelled in that test. Uh, and then from Pharaoh's test, uh, that's when we now, the sweetness start beginning uh, because the promotion began. Say amen. He became the second in command in the whole land of Egypt. See, what we want is that we, we want to move from zero to hero. We don't see all the struggles uh, that is in between. Uh, and as he's there, he's now promoted. Uh, and how many of you know that's not just the end of it? Now he's a powerful man. And he had to pass that power test. Because when he saw his siblings, he could easily well have told them, kill them all. For they did me wrong. You know, I know I'm not... And I thank God I'm not Joseph, you know, I'm Glenn and, you know. But if I was Joseph, you know the first thing I'll do when I'm being promoted? Guess what I'll do? I'll look for that man by the name of Potiphar. Okay? Now I'm above you, okay? Now I'm second in command. You are just a governor. I'm going to know that with revenge. <laughs> Come on. I spent... 20 years in jail for nothing, and I'm out, and I'm second in command. I mean, you know, I'll call your wife, Potiphar's wife, come here. Did I really tell the people, did I really do this? <laughs> I mean, if you know, but well, he's passed the test. He's not worried about what the past was like. From all scripture, we could see that the man by the name of Uriah was no doubt a man that we could classify as being tested and trusted. A man that is known for his integrity. In our text in verse 10, listen to what the Bible says. It says, uh, didn't you come from a long journey? Why didn't you go down to your house? Listen, and in our text, uh, we, we see that 
David is setting up things, you know, to cover his tracks. Uh, and he's uh, uh, trying to induce this man uh, to go and take responsibility for his own doing. But listen to what Uriah said in verse 11. And Uriah said to David, the ark of Israel, and the ark and Israel uh, and Judah are dwelling in tents. And my Lord Joab, the servant of my Lord, uh, are encamped in an open field. Shall I then go to my house, eat and drink, and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. That there is integrity. Now, I know most of us say, oh, we are home. This statement of Uriah indicated that he was very mindful he was very considerate of the conditions of his fellow soldiers. Yes, he's in a place of privilege. He's come back home. He really doesn't know why he's come back home. Nothing has been disclosed to him, but he maintains uh, his integrity. Uh, and he says, I'm not going to go and take advantage of returning home and spending time with my wife. Uh, I am at your service. I'm waiting for the next instruction from you. Though David had... Try that. David tried something else. David said, you know, get him drunk. When he drinks, he would lose his mind. So after feasting and drinking, uh, this man still maintained his principle of having concern uh, for what others are going through. Remember that statement. He has concern for what others are going through. So let's talk about a little bit about this man, Uriah. Uriah was a very skillful man. We know that he was a loyal man. He was a trained soldier. He's part of uh, the armies of Israel. He was a disciplined man, a man with experience. Uh, and can I say this? One of David's best soldiers. Even though he had all these attributes of being a trained soldier, he still could not fight alone. He depended and needed the support of other faithful men. I'm going somewhere. Doesn't matter how skillful you may be or how talented you are, you need others to function. They, uh, well, I, I'm skillful, I can do this, but I am a soldier. I can't fight alone. I need other men around me. This man was known uh, to be his brother's skipper. A man that would only fight as a team, not as an individual. A man that is more interested in the victory together, not as a sole victor. He wants to rejoice as a team. And for him, when we do things together, it matters. Oh, you go spend uh, 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 time with your wife. No, no, if I'm going to spend time with my wife, all of us must spend time with our wives. This is what togetherness is all about. And so we understand here, Uriah was a man who, that had high consideration for what others are going through. Today, in today's time, if we were to look for Uriah in this church, we would be looking for a man that we would call a fellowship man. You know what a fellowship man is? A fellowship man is a man that would, has embraced the values of this fellowship. Not a, a soul man that I am the master, I know certain things, I can do certain things. Uh, but Uriah was a fellowship man, uh, a man who aligns uh, his personal values uh, with uh, what the group believes. I can imagine if Uriah had done what David wanted him to do, the news would have gone back to the field. And the soldiers will be demoralized and say, all you needed to do was go back. And you did this. What about us? You can imagine the wives of the other soldiers. Uh, after Uriah had done what he needed to do at home with his wife, he's gone back to the battle. All the other wives will be talking. Why didn't David bring my husband down? They would never have known that there was a baby. That's the reason why David brought this. But tongues will begin to waggle. But this man maintained the fellowship values. We are in this together. So let's look secondly, not just at the tried and the tested man, which Uriah is. Let's look at the traitor. Being loyal 
equal to someone or something is under incredible assault in our generation. Excuse me. We can notice this in relationships. It's very, it's becoming more and more rare to be loyal in relationships. Husbands are dropping the level of their loyalty in their marriage. Wives are doing the same thing also. Friend to another. People can easily just betray one another. But this is what the Bible says, uh, that the love of many will come cold, will wax cold. We also become traitors. We can become traitors on the job. Can I say this to you? If your employer pays you and employs you to work eight hours, you are a traitor if you offer him five. Well, every other person is sending, you know, they're giving him four, three, you know, I give him five, I'm, I'm, I'm better than others. You're a traitor. We see this happen even in the church. Betrayals. Now, I know that doesn't happen here in Libala Church and it never would happen in, in, in Zambia, but where I come from, people betray one another even in church. Okay, good preaching, Pastor Glenn. I, 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 I knew that, you know. You know, let me read a quote to you. One man said this word. He said, some people aren't loyal to you. They are simply loyal to their need of you. There are two different things. They're not loyal to you. They are loyal to their need of you. And once their need changes, their loyalty changes. They, 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 they don't need you anymore. They found something else. You know, during the pandemic, we know this happened. And the result of that is what we are still seeing. You know, there was a time in our church, people rushed to church to find seats. And that's it, no more seats. I've had services that people are standing at the back. But what, you know what the pandemic has done? People are no longer loyal to the church. You think that they were loyal to you, loyal to the pastor, loyal to the song service, loyal to what we do? As long as you were meeting their needs, they're loyal to you. When they find someone else or something else that can meet their needs, their loyalty changes. And many that followed Jesus, the Bible says they came a time, they were loyal to Jesus. He fed 5,000. He fed 4,000. He healed the multitude. You can imagine that. We are for Jesus. We are loyal. And then when he just preached one single sermon and they didn't like the message, their loyalty shifted. I wonder where they shifted to. But certainly they left him. And he began to look at his quote-unquote loyal 12. Are you going to go also? And they replied, where do we go? We have come to know you that you have the words of life. People that have come to know Christ never leave him behind. Their loyalty is not seasonal. It is not temporal. They would hold on to Jesus until the very, very end. Many that followed even Jesus turned back from following him. One of them actually became, an, one of his core 12 became known as a traitor. This was not the case with Uriah. Uriah, we know that we can clearly see that this man was loyal to David. He says, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not do such thing. I've had people speak to me and say, Pastor, I am with you all the way. Come rain, come shine. I, when I came to this church, I, I, and they've testified publicly, oh, the best thing that's ever happened to me is found in the potter's house. And then when testing time comes, they don't even look, they don't even say goodbye to me. You just don't see them anymore. But we know that this is not the case with David and Joab. David and Joab were not as loyal 
unfaithful to Uriah the way Uriah was to them. David and Joab, uh, you know, David had plotted. Uh, he said, you know what, uh, uh, you know, this man is too trusted. Uh, he's, he's, he's a trusted man, uh, uh, but, but I, I, I've got to plot his destruction. The Bible says in the morning he wrote a letter, David wrote a letter and handed it over to Uriah addressed to Joab. Let's picture this for a moment. How many of you know if your pastor gave you an envelope and you could feel it and you could, your mind tells you it is money? Okay? You, 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 you experience, you know what money feels like. You could feel money. And he says, I want you to go and give it to uh, 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 um, uh, that widow or, or that family over there. Just give it to them. What should I tell them? No worry, just give it to them. How many of you know what we will do? We would want to know how much. We'll open the envelope. Now, y'all, y'all looking at me as though you're all siblings of Jesus. <laughs> y'all looking at me, oh, we'll never, we don't do that here, you know. Well, come on. Curiosity. We will open the envelope. I mean, it's a long journey. You're driving all the way down to Livingston. Something will tell you, open it. You're not stealing it. You're, faith, you're, not, you're not a thief. But we would like to know. We want to know how pastor is spending money. And then you open it and you count it. Wow. All this money for this. And you still give it to them. But not so with Joab. He is handed over to him his death certificate. Now, if I was Joab, I would do what I just said. Now, yeah, okay. Thank God I'm not Joab, but this is what my mind tells me. Let me see what King David is writing to you. Maybe it's just promoting me or promoting Joab. I just read it and then I say, Joab, this is a death certificate of Uriah. As he arrives, take him to the fiercest area of the battle. How many of you know, I will not go to the battlefield. Come on. I will find a way of diverting my journey to another area. And I will relocate. After all, I'm a Hittite. I'm not from the land. So if I go and live in Hittite, I will find a way of getting my wife to join me where I am. But to go and fight for this man, David, I wouldn't do it. Because I have seen that he wants me dead. Now let's move on very quickly. Uriah didn't do what we will do. He was put on the front line where the battles was fiercest and then that's not even the worst. You read it and it says when you leave, when you take Uriah to the battlefield, withdraw from him. Let all the troops withdraw from him and let him be, let him be killed. No, come on. A good man. Just waste him like that. Pull back. Pull back from Uriah. This pullback was to expose Uriah to the enemy that he may be killed. This was not a pullback of test. This was let him die on the battlefield. And you know he died. He was killed. But this is the irony. Uriah did not die because he couldn't handle the intensity of the battle. He's a fighter. Uriah did not die because all of a sudden he became a coward. And he's running for his life and somebody shot him or pulled an arrow and struck him on his head. Rather, Uriah died because of betrayal negligence from those whom he once defended, now they are not defending him. Those who he once stood for are no longer standing for him. You can imagine Uriah, the battle is raging, and all of a sudden Uriah looks around And he sees the numbers 
are dropping, not dying. People are running. And he's in the trench. And he's trying to fight these enemies of the people of God. And before he knew it, he looked around, no Joab, no one, not no one else except him. I said, oh Lord, I'm all by myself. What do I do? Those that he once said to, I cannot sleep with my wife because my brothers are in the field. The same brothers are the ones that said, you be on your own. We have an instruction from the king to withdraw. Listen to me. The king sold him out. His commander, Joab, sold him out. And finally, if those two sold him out, how many of you know his fellow soldiers also sold him out? That's a painful thing. So when I was growing up, I, 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 had, I have a brother, an older brother, who was not really a rugged fighter, but he had friends that, uh, you know, were rugged and they liked to fight. And so as soon as I knew that I have an older brother, um, I was a troublemaker as a kid. Now, I don't look a troublemaker anymore, thank God for that. But as a kid, I was very boastful. I would boast about things that people would hear, wow. I was very, bo and I, I boasted, and I was a troublemaker because in my mind, I, I, I've got my older brother who would back me up. I look for trouble everywhere. One day, I, 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 you know, I am very prolific when it comes to using the catapult and stone. I mean, I don't need a catapult. If I aim at that lady wearing pink at the very end near the take my, I think I was David incarnate, but I'll throw the stone and it would hit so good. So people had a name for me in the neighborhood. And they will all, because I, I am guaranteed that if I cause trouble, my brother and his friends will defend me one day. I went to look for trouble with this girl. She was my, she's my next door neighbor. I dislike her. I still, sorry. I, I, don't know where, I don't know where she is, but the memory, I still dislike her. I went to look for trouble, you know, and I, I, I always bullied them and fight, and him and her brother would just, so this time, I, I went to look for trouble, uh, but unfortunately, my brother has left to go to secondary school. He's in boarding school. I'm looking for trouble, uh, and uh, I realized there's no one behind me to defend me. Now, least uh, I got the beating of my life that day, a girl beat me silly, you know. Now, I'm confessing to you now, you know. She beat me, you know, she beat me so badly she sat on me. And I, 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 she, when she just sat on me like that, I'm screaming, my brother, my brother, nobody to rescue me. I was in pain. Because my brother that always covered me was nowhere to be found. Think about Uriah for a moment. Those who were meant to cover Uriah exposed him for the enemy to be devoured. That's painful. A husband that's meant to cover his wife leaves his wife alone to be assaulted by life. As a pastor, I felt, I've, I've felt that many times. As a pastor, I realized that I need faithful men, men that won't pull back from supporting me when the enemy comes against me. I, I need men like that, and I, I want to say that your pastor needs men like that in this church, that they are not going to pull back when he's in the front line, when he's engaging the enemy. I, I was in the prayer room this evening. I don't know who the person is. I didn't even want to know who the person is. But as I was in the prayer room, I, I heard a brother praying. And he was not ashamed about his prayer because he wasn't praying for others to say, but he was praying for Pastor George. God help Pastor George as he leads our fellowship here in Zambia. That's the kind of people that I'm looking for. Knowing that every day of my life I am faced with enemies. 
But what we find is that men and women that are meant to cover and help and support, they pull back. And then when church is, is, when the church is struggling either in finances or in impact or in growth, it's easy to point at the pastor and say he must be doing something wrong. And I've had that in my ministry. But here lies the paradox. The true enemies of Uriah were not those that he was fighting against in the front line. But the true enemies of Uriah are those that should have defended him. And listen to what the, listen to what the Bible says about, about this. Okay? We know that he's now on the front line, he's fighting, he's all left by himself. Those that were meant to support him and protect him were no longer there. One man says these words, don't be worried about the enemies that confront you and stab you in the front. Be more concerned about the friend that stabs you in the back. Psalms chapter 55 exposes this, that we would all face this in your life. To somebody that you think is your friend, but they're the one gossiping about you. Psalms 55 verse 12, this says, For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from him. But it was you. My, a man, my equal, my companion, my acquaintance. We took counsel, sweet counsel together. We walked to the house of God uh, in throng. We attended services together. We lifted up our hands uh, in the church together. Yet you are the one that is stabbing me in the back. The issue here isn't Uriah's weakness or Uriah's inexperience. The real issue here has to do with betrayal and wickedness. That some men watch good men or good people die and said nothing about it. I wonder how many strong soldiers in the Lord have died in the field because of betrayal. You see, even strong soldiers have been fatally wounded by the lack of the indifference of people. Let me tell you something. Every church that you plant, every couple that you plant out of this conference, whether out of the Libala church or out of the Chingola church or out of the Ndola church, doesn't matter where they go from. These were once men uh, that took counsel with you. They sat down in church with you. You, you fellowship with them. And then they go to the front line. They go to the battle. They respond to the call of God. They are in the front line. They are, some of them are bleeding. Some of them are bruised, battered. And you know what happens? You pull back. How do you pull back? Very many ways. Number one, rather than pray for them for victory continually, you stop praying for them as soon as they leave your church. Impact teams, you don't even think about it anymore. When they say, we, were, we are going to go to our baby church, we need to go and support them, you hardly even bother about it. It doesn't concern you. Let them be. And thirdly, when we raise money for world evangelism, or the pastor raise money, we want to support the baby church in that, you don't even give in to it. You know what you're doing? You're letting a good couple die. You pull back from them, and you don't get involved at all. Be great if you pick up a phone call and just say, brother so-and-so, pastor so-and-so, we just want to tell you that, uh, you know what, we're praying for you, we're excited about what God is doing, uh, uh, we just want to, we've got your back. When we pull back in troubled times, a a anyone that pulls back in troubled times, you know what we're literally doing? We're saying, let them die. Somebody's going to die when we pull back. Innocent people will die. The death doesn't have to be physical. You're not calling them. You're not, you're not encouraging them. They die 
with exhaustion. They're left on the battlefield by themselves. They die in emotions. They die financially. They die mentally. They die spiritually. When we pull back in times of vulnerability of others, we expose our brethren to unknowing and then unnecessary pressure and we partner with their enemies. Let me say this. It is at this point of pulling back that our actions in, towards our brethren is noticed by God. Anything that we do for or against is noticed by God. And in our text this evening, we know that God noticed what's going on between David, Uriah, and Bathsheba. And you know what happened? Uh, you know, uh, it would hold us accountable for either supporting or pulling back. So well, here is what God does. God saw what David was doing. David couldn't see God looking. But God looked and saw what David was doing. So he tells Nathan, you know the story. Go and tell David, uh, put him a satire, put in an example. If somebody did this, and somebody, uh, uh, David brags and boasts and says, oh yeah, kill him. And then Nathan tells him, you are the man. And uh, you are the one that initiated uh, a needless death. You committed adultery. And you try and cover your tracks. You killed an innocent man. You will pay for it. So mark it down tonight. No traitor of God's people or God's church will ever get away with their action. No matter when, how, God will catch up with them. So being a traitor should not be an option. Little did Judas know that by going secretly to go and sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver will be known by all, they knew. And you know one thing that is funny? The traitors always die before the person they betray. Judas betrayed Jesus and ultimately, boom, he dies. David betrays um, um, uh, Uriah. He didn't die physically, but something died in him. He says, you've got blood in your hands. You are not going to exalt me anymore. Yes, I know you repent. But something dies in the traitor. So let's look as I close tonight. We're going to pray. Let's look at the tragedy of all of this. The question I have for all of you is simple. And I'm not asking you to respond in answering directly to me, but did Uriah have to die? My answer to that is no. He need not have to die. The king could have put Uriah, uh, it's okay, you, okay, you don't want to cover my tracks for me? I'm going to send you back to uh, 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 your land. I'm going to send you back to the Hittites. After all, you don't have any Abrahamic covenant with us. We conquered you, you become our warrior, you become our slave, fight for us. He could, have, he could have sent him away with his wife, retired him early, but no. But something had to die. A few things happened quickly. Number one is a home was broken. The family of Uriah and Bathsheba, that marriage was broken. The second thing that happened was a man died physically. Number three, an unwanted baby was born but died. Just because of one man's action. And then a family was destroyed. So much so that Bathsheba's grandfather became so bitter against David because he had thought he had covered all his trap. Bathsheba would have told him, Grandpa, the pregnancy, the baby that I lost belongs to King David. And now I'm, I'm now his wife. Ahithophel the grandfather of Bathsheba. This man was a loyal man to David, an advisor. But because of what David had done, he had destroyed 
his family, disintegrated the Uriah's and Bathsheba's household. Everything has gone. And he's still pretending to be a good king. Something welled up in this old man and said, I can't be with David anymore. You know the story. Absalom rebelled against his father. Absalom could do that conveniently because he recognized the weakness of his father in uh, dealing with his own personal sins. So if I rebel against my father, that's okay. So, but you know the first person that Absalom engaged on his side was Ahithophel. And Ahithophel would give him advice, this is what you want to do to David. And he was giving Absalom advice because of the bitterness of what David had done to Bathsheba, his granddaughter. Sometimes our action, our inactions can lead to the departure or even the demise of others. Many other people have to die because of this issue. There are people that are no longer serving God in your church. They used to sit there. They used to worship with us. They are no longer serving God in this church. Some of them are no, even, no longer serving God at all anymore. You know why? Perhaps because at the crucial point in their life, a time when they needed you to be there, for them. Time when they needed you to stand by them, you pulled back. Now they are dead. One of the things that saddens me is that we have records of people that get saved in our church. I can say that tens of thousands of people have been saved in 26 years of my ministry in our church. But we don't have a fraction of that coming to church today. Many people have died, died. And I'm not talking physical death now. Die, they just die. You get saved today by Wednesday, they are dead. Nobody follows up on them, nobody calls them up, nobody cares. When they needed you the most, you pulled back. Because if I go follow up on him, he's going to encroach on my private time. I don't have money to give him. I don't have, you just let new converts die. Now, I don't know what your follow up life is like here, but it's something that we have struggled with for years in our church. Because when they needed you to give them a cold cup of water to their thirsty soul, you ignored them. Because when they needed a push, just a little bit of a push, we pretended as though they were never there. When they needed a shoulder to cry on, we simply walked away. But that's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us in Galatians 6 2. It tells us that bear one another's burden so you fulfill the law of Christ. I close tonight. I wonder, as you're seated in this building, are you guilty of pulling back? In what area have you pulled back? You're in church, but you're no longer fellowshipping with people. You're in church, but you're not interested in follow-up ministry. You've left it alone for a handful of people. You're in church, but you don't attend Bible study. You're in church, you've pulled back from evangelism. You've pulled back from ministry. And this is the danger with older people, because they feel that let the young people do it. I'm, I've done my own share. You begin to pull back. I wonder. And the painful thing about Uriah's death is this. Some Uriah will have had best friends on the field. He would have had loyal, good friends. They grew up together. Uriah would have, and, but not one of them, not even one of them. When Joab said, pull back from Uriah, not one of them could say, Uriah, Uriah, come, come, come. Not one of them uh, challenged Joab, 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 we are all going. What about Uriah? Come on, let's get him back. He's one of us. Not one person stood for him. Yet the Bible says, bear one another's burden. And this is a call for true Christian, biblical Christianity. Can I say this in closing? Sitting next to you is your own Uriah. I want you to look to the left and look to the right. However distant they may be, that's your Uriah. You took counsel together. 
The question is, are you unknowingly betraying them? Do you know when they cry? Do you know their struggles? Do you know when they're weak in Christ? And if you say, yes, I do, how do you strengthen them? I'm strengthened by a handful of people that have come to be my friends, of which one of them is your pastor. We don't have to see each other every week, every month, every year. As a matter of fact, for a long time. But I know I can be strengthened by his words. I can be strengthened by his presence. Do you have people that can strengthen you? Or do you have people that you are strengthening? We find strength in one another. Say amen. Not just in the numbers, but in the deep commitment that I'll cover your back. I'll cover your back. Whatever you're going through, you may choose to disclose it, but I'm, you could trust me. I'll cover your back. I close with this true story. I was listening to my daughter's podcast. She has a weekly podcast in England. And uh, I, I'm so busy, I never get to listen to it. But my wife is a re just religiously listens to it. And, and she interviews people and they talk. Today's topic, or uh, to your Wednesday, today's topic, I didn't even hear the topic. But one thing I was hearing was they were saying, oh, okay, so when somebody says, uh, uh, I'll pray for you, do they actually pray for you? Or they say that just to make you feel okay? And I was challenged listening to her. She's over 7,000, 8,000 miles away from me. I was challenged listening because there are many times I've told people, hey, bro, I pray for, I'm praying for you. And I've never prayed for them. And you know what my daughter said? She said, the next time you want to tell somebody, I'll, I'll pray for you, it doesn't cost you anything more to say, let's pray now. By saying, I'll pray for you, most of us forget and the person is relying on you to be praying for them. How many times as a pastor have I told people, I'm going to be praying for you? And I haven't. Not because I hate them or I simply forget. Even if it's one person, I'm as guilty as you. So the next thing, that, the next, let people know that they can depend on you to pray for them. I know a few people that pray for me. Who do you pray for? Whose back have you gotten? Or from who are you pulling back? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. As we bow our heads tonight, I want to especially thank God for making it possible that I am here with you, and you are here with him. And together, through this week, we have been spoken to one way or the other by God and his spirit. People have been saved. People have rededicated their lives to Christ. Some have been touched by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Some have come, and they've been refreshed. And I don't know what this week has done for you, but one thing I do know, it hasn't been a waste for me. What I have seen, what I have learned, I'm taking back with me. I want the double portion of what God is doing in your church. I am believing God for greater things for your church because you're a candlestick church in a candlestick fellowship. This church is known globally. The lives that you have encouraged, lives that you have supported, baby churches that you carry their burdens, disciples that you're raising up, others that one day will be raised up and would touch the nations of the world. The faithfulness of pastors that have led this church in times past Memories of the early days of uh, Pastor Vic Eason, uh, with memories of the early days uh, of Pastor Steve Bowman, uh, with me memories of Pastor Jeff Day, who's coming back to see what God's still doing. And now God has entrusted your spiritual development into the hands of Pastor George and his wife. 
So I want to challenge you, first of all, these are not the days to pull back. Don't pull back because, oh, all of a sudden you know the kind that this is our own now. No, this is God's own. Don't pull back. Don't pull back from ministry because you are being challenged, corrected, uh, or removed. Don't pull back. Don't pull back from giving because times are difficult and funds are low. Don't pull back from it being involved. Because every time we pull back, someone dies. And so tonight, before we move on to do other things, maybe you're here, you're not saved. Maybe you're not right with God, you're not born again. Beloved, I want to declare to you that God loves you deeply. He cares about you. He knows who you are. He knows what you've gone through, the difficulty, the challenges, the lies. He knows everything concerning you. He also knows that you are struggling right now to making a decision for him. And he's about to help you push back the forces of darkness so that you could choose light. He knows that the devil is whispering to you, don't do it tonight. But he's wondering, who would you believe? Tonight, you're here, you're not saved, you're not right with God, maybe you're a backslider, you knew God yesterday, sometime before. But as you're sitting in this building, your relationship with Christ has gone cold. Things have encroached, you've compromised. But tonight, God is calling you by his spirit, come back home, brother. Come back home, daughter, come. I'm waiting for you. If that's who you are, under the sound of my voice and the, and the presence of the Holy Spirit, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, I want to challenge you and encourage you. Would you expose the devil's hold over your life by lifting up your hand? I want to come to Jesus. Come on, lift it up high. Don't, this is not the time to consider looking at me. You've looked at me for 40 minutes. Now look within your heart. Come on, would you raise up your hand? I want to pray for you right now. Don't hold back. God is waiting for you. Don't pull back from this altar call. Don't pull back. Is there a hand? I see that hand. Put it back down. Would there be someone else? These are not. Listen, you will be glad you responded. Maybe somebody is gently speaking to you. We are not here to embarrass you. We are trying to encourage you. Surrender this life of yours and taste of the Lord and see that he's good. Come on, saints. Would you raise up your hand? I want to pray with you. Come on, lift it up high. Shame the devil. Come on. One last call. We're going to move on to other things. Backslider or unsaved. Put down your hand, young man. Would there be someone else to join this one? Come on. All through the week, God's been touching lives. Let him touch yours. Would you lift up your hand over and above your head? Quickly, let me see that hand. Anyone at all? Come on. I know you're battling. I know you're struggling. I could feel it, bro. That's how I felt 30 years ago. I came into a church similar to this. And as I was there, God was dealing with me, but pride was also encouraging me not to respond. But right now, put pride aside. Uh, pass the test. Some of you are being tested right now. Would you respond and excel and watch what God's going to do in your life? Come on, raise up your hand. I want to pray for you. Lift it up high. Amen. That man that raised up his hand. Look at me, sir. Look at me. Did you mean that? Did you mean that you're sincere before God? Come. He has waited for you for so long. Come. Somebody's going to help you. Make sure they repeat the sinner's prayer. Do you want to come? Because you're looking around. If you don't want to come, that, but if you want to come, come. Come. Hallelujah. God's going to help you. I know it's, you're struggling. You're fighting it. But now that you've responded, God, heaven is rejoicing. Bow your knees down to Christ. Christians, it's time to make some fresh commitments and vows before God. You pray that God, if there is anything in my life that would will make me want to pull back, hold back. I want you to take it away from my life. If you know any area that you're pulling back in, 
Bring it before God at this altar, and then we're going to pray the other prayer I want to pray. These altars are open. Let's all stand together, every one of us. Uh, let's all stand as the worship team will sing a song. But let us all stand. Let's pray. Step out of your seat. If you know that an area, you are pulling back from your affection uh, to your spouse. You are pulling back from church activities. You are pulling back from reading the Bible. You are pulling back from the fervent prayer. You are pulling back. Somehow you are pulling back. Every time you pull back, someone dies. Come, step out of your seat. Don't hold back. If you want to sit on the front row here to pray, just come. But sitting down where you are just doesn't make any, you know, I'm just there. You know, come. Sing a song. Come on. Makando Ramashanda Ramasa. Father, I'm asking you, Lord. I repent, God, in my own personal life. Areas that I have pulled back from serving. From being involved. Everything. Have mercy on me. To you. God, have mercy on me. Withholding nothing. And I surrender all to you. All around us, I will rise. Everything I give to you. I am your Uriah. Withholding nothing. You are my Uriah. Withholding nothing. Salamon dosi. And I surrender all to you. And everything I give to you. Yes, Jesus. Withholding nothing. God have mercy. Withholding nothing. I give myself away. Oh God of heaven, I'm sorry, Lord. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. And I surrender all to you. Yes, Jesus. And everything I give to you. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. God, I'm thankful. Withholding nothing. Give myself away. Give myself away, so you can use me. Give myself away, give myself away, so you can use me. Come on, let's begin to give God all the thanks. Come on, raise up your voices tonight. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to partake um, in this altar called Rabba Lamandose. Kiala Riba Laba Rebobo Sandama. God set the captives free. God use our lives to enrich others. Oh, we thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. You can find your seats. Uh, I did tell you, uh, I didn't realize uh, uh, when I said to you yesterday that I'm going to be praying for uh, uh, people's tools of the trade, that there will be this many people in church uh, tonight. It's good that you came, and uh, maybe somebody invited you and told him what uh, the visiting preacher is about to do. We appreciate you coming. And so what I want to do, I can't obviously pray for everybody, uh, but I do believe Listen to me, if you ever know uh, the, uh, uh, the story of Jesus feeding 5,000 people, uh, not once did Jesus carry the basket over to each one of them to take a bread and uh, take a piece of fish. Uh, 
Uh, he told the disciples to let them sit down uh, in groups uh, of 50, and then they sit down there. And uh, he blessed the, the, the basket, uh, and then he handed it over to the disciples uh, uh, to go and distribute it. Uh, and there was all sufficient, uh, and even the boy that donated his goods uh, went home uh, with uh, uh, five, uh, uh, 12 baskets full. That's another sermon for another day. But tonight I want to pray. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, the pastors that are here uh, that are currently either pastoring a church or they're ordained and uh, uh, in right standing. I want them to come here, uh, beginning with Pastor George. What I want to do is, uh, and I've seen Pastor Mitchell do this. I was in Australia when Pastor Mitchell uh, just uh, empowered the pastors uh, to go and uh, serve the people. Okay, I, I'm not Pastor Mitchell, I'm Pastor Glenn, uh, but one thing I know is that uh, I, I want to pray for pastors first with their tools of their trade. Let them come with the tools of their trade. I'll pray for them, then uh, they will empower the whole church. Otherwise, uh, this will take forever to pray for all of you. And so, um, uh, and this is not selective, okay? I've seen, I've done this before, and people try and Go to the where the Pastor Glenn is so that uh, it's Pastor Glenn that prays for them. Listen, there is nothing different. Uh, these men were ordained and anointed uh, by God uh, the way I was ordained and anointed by God. Uh, and thank God we have a leader amongst us here. And so what we will do is this. We need ushers. We're going to do this quickly and, uh, and uh, purposefully. Uh, uh, you know, we want the ushers. I want the ushers to come and stand at the edges here. Come on, ushers. I, I guess that you standing at the back of the ushers. Okay, okay. So if you are an usher, you take one one lane here. Okay, stay in the middle here. You take your lane here. Who is the usher that will look after this place? Quickly, let's do this. An usher will look after 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 this. And uh, might I ask you to join this group over here or come to the front seats here? Okay, you look after that V shape there. Go there, go, go near there. Okay, you stay in the middle here. We don't have an usher looking after here. Come on, let's not, Pastor, come to the carpet. You come to the carpet. Come to the carpet, come to the carpet, come to the carpet. Okay, so you look after the needs there. And so what we're going to do there, one, two, three, stay in front of them, sir. Stay in front of them. One, two, three, four. It's in front of them here. In front of them here. Four, five, and six. One, two, three, Four, five, and six. <laughs> very, very easy. And so this is what we're going to do. I'm going to pray for them with the tools of their trade, okay? And they will put it down and then anoint the rest of So you bring them, you go and meet that group over there. Intermittently, myself and Pastor George will come to each group, okay? So... I don't know who I'm going to be praying for. I'm not targeted to pray for any particular person. But we would scan through the groups and just back up whatever is being done. Our prayer is very simple. Let me warn those of you that are coming with things. Whatever you're bringing here must be visible. Okay? Don't, don't bring um, some powder that you, where, where, you blow. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't work. Okay? Don't be ashamed of what you are bringing. Okay, so let me have this. Don't, don't be ashamed of what you are bringing. Don't bring it and start doing like this. That's the prayer. No, just bring it. Just bring it like this. Okay, don't put it in areas that are dangerous for us to pray. Don't, don't put it here. Okay? Listen, I've done this many, many, I've seen strange things. Don't, we would not go to that area. Don't, don't put it here, okay? Just put it like this. Be proud of what you have. Don't be ashamed. Amen. Say amen. amen. Pastors, if you don't see them do this, just bring it up and do it for them. Okay, bring it like this. Now, uh, the other thing that we want to also say is this. When we pray for something, don't take it home and put it on the, uh, on the mantle and say, this is the onion that Pastor Glenn prayed for. I put a, don't, don't turn it into an idol. It's just a contact. Even Peter, handkerchief, sent it home for healing. Okay? 
I've had pastor Mitchell tell us to bring our wallets out. I brought out my wallet. I needed money in my wallet, and I thank God. Money didn't go inside that day, but I haven't gone begging. So don't, this is not a, a doctrine, okay? Don't say, hmm, Protestants have changed their doctrine. Mm, this is not a doctrine. This is what I'm inspired to do, Okay? This is what I'm inspired to do. Moses was told, what do you have in your hands? It's a rod. Okay? He uses the rod to tend the flock of Jethro. It was the same rod that he brought. He didn't go and get a special. And when he finished, he still carried that rod wherever he was going. He, was not, he didn't turn the rod into an idol. Don't turn this into an idol. Okay? Are you, is it simple? Yes. You must scrutinize. Okay? Don't let them try and manipulate because people are strange. I have seen, I've been in a country, I won't mention the country. <laughs> Somebody, anyway. <laughs> so, I want to pray for you. Come closer, we are pastors. Come closer. Come closer here. Hallelujah. Now, when I pray for you, I want you to pray for me. Okay? Because I want to be enlarged also in my ministry. I have brought my Bible. This is the tool of my trade. Let's stretch out our hands towards these pastors. Father, by the blood of your wonderful son, Jesus. Lord, I'm asking that you breathe upon the efforts. God of your son's servant. Lord, I'm asking supernatural breakthrough. Favor, God, even here on earth. Anointing beyond his request, God, in his endeavor. Yes. God, a surprise door opening, my God. Breathe upon the effort of my brother. God, anoint him to anoint others, oh God. Lord, I'm asking God that you breathe upon the effort of my brother. God, anoint his vocation, oh God of heaven. Breathe upon the effort of my brother. Show him favor, influence, impact. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Move back a little bit. So I need you to pray for me, Pastor George, if you don't mind. I'm asking. God, I'm asking. We More anointing. Kilar and Dandunda. Kilamanda Rabashan. Useful verse into your hands. Sakilabandu. Double portion. We pray God supernatural. Kilamanda. Move impact. God. Signs and wonders to accompany his ministry. To the glory of your name. God. We seal this. Oh, Father, with the seal of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Upon his life and his ministry. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you. Thank you. Brother, who is, who is the one playing the keyboard? Okay, just play. Oh, all right. Just play the blood of Jesus. Go to that end. Go to this end. He will direct them to you. Put your tools down. Put your tools down. He will direct them to you. Do it in order. Okay, whatever order you want to do. Stand here. Do it in order. You stay here with them. Okay. No, no, no. You stay here with them. Okay. You stay here with them. Pastors are finished. Okay. Okay. We will start here. Okay, so you arrange the people to come. If your side is finished, okay, you know what? You go over there. There's a lot there. We, we, this is a few people. So once we finish this bit, okay, you go get your own two. Okay? All right, okay. Yeah, after them. You're servants now, all of us. Okay. Start bringing them. That's it. Okay, next person. Quickly. Let's start. Just get the people to come. Queue up behind. Come on. Queue up. Don't wait to be told. Just wait. Queue up. Queue up behind them. And then once they finish, no, you're meant, to, you're meant to pray for them. Just the way I did. Let them queue up in one area and sit down back. Once you are being prayed for, go and sit down. Sir, sir, get all of them up, queue up, so that they can come and go and sit down back. Yes, take it up. Father, my God, God, I'm asking for your anointing. Lord, in the name of Jesus, 
breathe, oh God, upon our efforts. Retentive memory in the name of Jesus. Breathe upon my brother by the Holy Ghost. Anoint his effort in the name of Jesus. God, I'm thanking you. God, our success in his endeavors by the Holy Ghost. Anoint our efforts. God, I'm asking to breathe upon her efforts in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm asking for supernatural blessings upon her life. Show her kindness in the name of Jesus. God, we are asking for your grace upon my sister's effort. God, breathe upon what she's brought in Jesus' name. God, I'm... God, I'm asking for the Holy Ghost. Lord, touch my sister in a fresh new way. God, show her kindness by the Holy Ghost. Everybody's done? Everybody's done? Queue up. Bring them. Queue up. Have you been prayed for? Go and find your seat. Everybody, queue up at the same time. Who's on this side? Come here. Come on. Have you been prayed for? You've, oh, very good. God, I'm asking the tools of his trade, breathe upon it by the Holy Ghost. Jesus, I'm asking you. God, I'm asking, give him favor on his employment, in his job. Show him kindness, oh God. God, educationally, raise it up. God, I'm asking you to touch his mind. Get, make him excellent in his studies. Retentive memory. By the Holy Ghost, uh, retentive memory in the name of Jesus. Show her kindness, oh God. Hilarando said, retentive memory, oh God. I'm asking you, anoint her mind. Make her excel in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name. Quickly, quickly, quickly. What was that? What was it? Hold it. Hold it. Have you been prayed for? They prayed for you? Father, I'm asking you, Lord, by the Holy Ghost, God, it's supernatural favor upon his life in Jesus' name. Come. What do you have? Sorry? Go sorry out and come back. Quickly. Just show me the thing. Bring whatever you do. Quickly. Quickly. Kimarando Santaraba. Okay. Okay. Father, I'm asking to breathe upon my brother's effort. God, show him supernatural favor with those that he comes in contact with, that he will remember today as the date of a turning point in his life. In Jesus' name. God, God, I'm thanking you. What do you have? What do you have? It's got nothing? Well, let him go get something. He doesn't have anything. Let him go get something. Yes. Supernatural moving. Kamanda. Lord, anoint her by the Holy Ghost. Kinada Basa. Kingdom Ashanda. Come quick. What's this? We give you all the honor, Lord. Bless in Jesus' name. Okay. All the things you do. Father, I'm asking to show my sister kindness, favor my God, business opportunities, uh, strategies for survival. God, I'm asking you that you'll anoint her, God. Uh, let her know that today you turn the story around uh, in her favor. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, what do you do? You're the sound man here. Is that what you do for a living? Is that what you do? What do you do for a living? Open the name of the business. Let me see. Open it. Okay. Okay. Is it Father, I'm asking you that you'll anoint 
God, your son. Give him strategies for ideas, and ideas for business. God, as he labors in your house, show him kindness, oh God. Lord, I'm asking an enlargement beyond his request even right now, God. Show him favor, God, in his requests, oh God. Okay. Father, I'm asking you, Lord, that you grant my brother favor, even on his endeavors, God, promotion, my God. Let him stand out as a light in that company, God, in that organization. God, uh, give him ideas for survival, oh God. Uh, Lord, let him have influence in this land, oh God. Uh, show him favor. Breathe upon his efforts uh, in Jesus' name. Okay. This is your business? Okay, let's pray. Father, by the Holy Ghost, Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, that you uh, show my brother supernatural favor. God, I'm asking, Lord, that fear would be banished in his life. Uh, kindness uh, direct his path. Uh, bring him in contact with those that will need his services. Uh, in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Have you been prayed for? You've been prayed for. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Those that I said to go and get something. Maybe you didn't know about this. The least you could do is to write it down and bring it here. But if that's it, that's it. Okay. So one more person there. Okay. You could find your seats. I want to pray for you. Something about your spirit that is right. God wants you to know that he's pleased with you. You may not always see yourself as pleasing to others, or maybe you match up or meet up, but he's pleased with you. Don't try and be who you are not. Continue to be who you are. Let the joy of the Lord, let it radiate through you. You may not have what others have, but what you have, most people don't have. And so treasure that. You are a treasure before God. You may have been told otherwise, but I'm telling you, you are a treasure before God. And if you focus your life as being a helper, if you just, I just want to, I just want to help people, okay? God will send helper your way. There are destiny helpers that are looking for you. They will help you locate your destiny as you help others find their destiny. Okay? You married? Where's your husband? Okay. Come back her up. Come and back her up. Pastor, would you come, please? Put your hands behind your wife. I want you to speak blessings upon this woman because this woman, through her life, will become not just a blessing to you, but a blessing to this land. Okay? Through her life. If you back her up, don't pull back from her when God stay with her. Stretch out your hands, church. Let's pray for our sister. Father, by the Holy Ghost right now, I bring my sister. God, before you, God, you have seen. Lord, in the secret places, uh, the battles that she has fought, the tests that she has come across, but God, you are taking her, God, beyond Pharaoh's throne. You are taking her to a place of supernatural touch and favor, oh God. No one knows the struggles of her past. No one needs to know the struggle of her past, but you have had her at the forefront of your mind. She's an apple of your eye now. Expose her to your treasures. Expose her to your favors. As she pours out on others, God, replenish her in the mighty name of Jesus. Delight her, my God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for letting me pray with you. It's okay. God has handpicked you. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to thank you. I, I want to thank you. I have thoroughly enjoyed myself much more than a duty I have had a well swell of a time. I'm so excited. That I have few friends. Honestly. My wife knows I have few friends. 
even in ministry, few. But your pastor is one of those few. And so, it didn't just happen now. It happened. And we're growing deeper and deeper. And who knows where God is taking us? I have no idea, but I'm ready. If it's God, then I'm ready to go with him. But I want to thank him and his wife. I want to thank Sister Irene. I haven't seen her. Is she here? She's inside. I have put on weight since I've been here. Hospitality legendary. But I'm hoping that they will come to Nigeria and help us as they are helping you here. Love them. Don't stress them up. You will enjoy them for a long time. And I want to thank you for coming out every night to hear me preach. Well, the Lord bless you all. See you sometime next. Hallelujah. Amen. We thank God for what he's doing. Amen. What he's done.